All right, hello, and welcome to the Daily Space for today, November 8th, 2019. I am your host, Annie Wilson, and most Mondays through Fridays, someone from our team will bring you the latest in all that is new in space and astronomy. So today I have three stories for you, um, or rather, I know I have had for sure three slides. Uh, Dr. Pamela wrote the script, so feel free to ask questions preface those questions with that wonderful star emote in chat. And if you're new and you don't realize it, I have two dogs and a cat as co-hosts. So Wayne Johnson, here's the cat, or here's the dog. So, and make it rain. All right, so um, there is some silliness in Twitch chat and it makes me smile. So um, yeah, let's get at it, shall we? Shall we? Shall we? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Oh no. All right. Hold up one second. Cause I just realized that the chroma key filter took out all the color from this image. Hey! My dogs, my dogs. Anyways, so uh, yeah, let's get at it. Uh, let's get started. So the first story I have for you today um, is another story of a galaxy on repeat. The Hubble Space Telescope has imaged a distant galaxy whose light comes to us thanks to the gravitational lensing of an intervening massive system. The distant arc being lensed in the story has been named the Sunburst Arc and it is located almost 11 billion years from us. Gravity and large systems can bend light that would normally go somewhere else to instead come toward us. In this case, a massive cluster of galaxies 4.6 billion years away is bending light towards us like sunlight passing through a lens, and like a lens, it increases the total amount of light we receive, allowing us to see things that would otherwise be too faint. This amplified distant light forms parts of a circle with 12 different stretched versions replicated 12 times. This kind of data is often used as a cosmology tool where science comes from comparing the different light paths taken by the replicate images. In this instance, it's actually the image itself that is exciting. The light from this particular galaxy was released when the universe was still very young and in the process of transitioning from the era of opaque neutral, gla neutral gas that we call the Dark Ages, literally, that is literally what the script says, the Dark Ages, to the transparent ionized gas phase that describes the bulk of the history of our universe. We are still trying to understand how the first stars turned on and how their light was able to push out galaxies and ionize the space between galaxies. And while there have been a number of theories, there has only been a small number of observations of how this ha has worked. With the sunburst arc, astronomers can add one new example and this example nicely shows how high energy photons can, according to the press release, leave, quote, or quote, leave the galaxy through narrow channels in a gas rich neutral medium. This is the first observation of a long theorized process, end quote. This, the kind of science being done in this research is a new example of researchers using indirect ways to observe objects in the early universe. It is hoped that JWST may someday be able to directly observe this stage in our universe's history, but until then, massive galaxy clusters are the lenses we have, and it is awesome to see how people are using them. Oh, that is pretty cool. All right. Next up, while our ability to image our earlier universe is still limited, we have enough information to constrain models that allow us to allow, excuse me, that let us explore in our computers the things that we can't see with our telescopes. 
Models have been around for as long as there have been computers, and they have been growing in complexity. Even though we've made leaps and bounds with computers, computing is still a limited resource. And until now, models have either been focused on either the one or two galaxy scale or cosmolo cosmological, wow, that's a mouthful, cosmological scales in which the effects inside the individual galaxies are lost. A new paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomy Society presents a model that manages to span both the scale sizes Oh no, to scan, pardon, let me start that over. A new paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astron Astronomical Society presents a model that manages to span both scale sizes thanks to the Hazel Hen supercomputer in Stuttgart, Germany. For more than a year, 16,000 cores focused on how a 230 million light year across cube of the universe would evolve across the age of the universe. This model included 20 billion particles representing dark, invisible matter, stars, cosmic gas, magnetic fields, and supermassive black holes, led by Dr. Annalisa Pilipich of the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy and Dr. Dylan Nelson from the Max also f no from the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics this team was able to discover new effects in the galaxy evolution that appears to be a true part of the story of how our universe changes over time since we can't watch a galaxy evolve seeing what happens in software is key what is beautiful in the simulation is that it is confined to match what effects we see and in the process of recreating is known to happen. The simulation revealed a number of effects that we hadn't seen before. Now that we are in this awesome place of having matched our models to what we have seen so far in the universe, we get to see if future observations match the things that we're now seeing in the models. That's a whole lot to digest. First of all, I'm still stuck on the 20 billion particles. I know a lot of you don't do anything with models or rendering or any of that, but just dealing with particles in, let's say Blender, which is a free 3D modeling program, particles are a pain and they're very, much uh, GPU and CPU uh, intensive. So yeah, 20 billion particles is a whole lot of bar particles and that would make your home computer crash, which is why this supercomputer has 16,000 cores. 16,000 cores. I don't know how many cores my computer has. I don't think it's more than like eight or 16, but 16,000 cores. To get something like that without it being a dedicated built-in supercomputer, you need to do uh, distributed computing, distributed computing like Boink, where you donate computer time, which is essentially cycles, which, mm, how, how much computer science do I have to use to explain this? So cycle, your computer has, your CPU has cycles, right? And the cycles are so fast, but each cycle does some instructions, whether that's uh, catching your mouse movement to, which literally interrupts everything else, to rendering pretty intense uh, models. So they got this super huge, literally supercomputer with all of these cores that's just insane told it to compute this one thing and just <laughs> The dogs apparently have strong feelings on supercomputers. Do you have strong feelings on supercomputers? Come here. Let's talk about your strong feelings on supercomputers. I know it seems weird to have a supercomputer to build this way. Hey, do you need to come here to talk about it too? 
I know. It seems weird that humans are putting this massive computer together and they're not using it to play video games. No, no, they're using it to do science. And when they do this, they tell the model to run and then they walk away for however many hours it takes. Because I'm sure this took hours. In fact, it said it did take for more than a year uh, to get all of this done. So yeah, wait, am I, how am I still muted? How am I still muted? Uh, okay. So Susie's like, you're muted, but uh, everybody else is like, we can still hear you. All right. Planetary Pan says, okay, every story should be explained to the puppers. <sighs> is that how we're going to do this now? Come here. I know you're just off screen though. Okay. All right. But yeah, this, this is, this is just wild to me and it's one thing to say, oh yeah, a supercomputer, but I feel like it needs to be broken down so you all can just appreciate it a little more. Yeah. If you didn't know, Dr. Pamela collects uh, computer scientists. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, let's see what, what we have for our next story. Also, I think, is this the, I think this is the model or it's a model. But all of the different angles and stuff. And the fact that they've found out more things from running a model is not, um, is not unusual. I remember being told of a model that was generated and then put on a planetarium dome. Planetarium dome is half of a sphere. And if you're lucky enough to have full dome video, which is video that literally covers this whole half a sphere, you can get some pretty amazing things up on the dome. And um, they were able to see stuff that they weren't able to see before. So yeah, I know that's not a very technical explanation, but they were able to see things that they weren't able to see before, partially because of the resolution and just how it was displayed. So, all right, now for real, let's move on to the next story. All right, so for our final story of the day, we are going to jump from looking at evolving galaxies to, ins to looking instead at a single dead star. All right, hold on, because this is going to be a whole lot of letters and numbers together. All right, so Sierra Alpha X-Ray space. <laughs> so Sax, Juliet 1808.4-3658. Got all of that? Sax J1808.4-3658 is a neutron star located 11,000 years away in a binary system with a brown dwarf companion rotating at 104 times per second. This collapsed stellar remnant can be called a pulsar and is several times larger than the sun in mass, but is closer to the size of Manhattan Island in diameter. So take the mass of the sun and squish it down to like Manhattan Island. Uh, the pull of gravity on the surface of this exceedingly dense object is actually enough to generate nuclear reactions in the material falling onto the surface. This exact kind of sudden fusion was observed by the NICER. Astronomers are really not allowed to name anything. That's uh, November India Charlie Echo Romeo telescope on the International Space Station. This particular pulsar is gravitationally stripping material off of its diminu diminutive neighbor. And when enough matter builds up, it ignites. It goes to its neighbor. It pulls off a whole, it, it goes to its neighbor. It grabs a whole bunch of material after bullying them for it. And then it just blows up. Well, ignites, not necessarily blows up. Anyways, this is what happened on August 20th when a single 20 second event gave off as much energy as the sun gives off in nearly 10 days. 
Whoa. These kind of cannibalistic stars are remarkably complex, and if our slow news trends continue, we'll be doing a deep dive into their science on Monday. Wow. 20 seconds to give off as much energy from the sun, or to give off as much energy as the sun does in 10 days. That's wild, y'all. And just the fact that it bullies its neighbor for material and then, you know, ignites also amuses me to no end. <laughs> Veronica Cure says, I hope this isn't on the test. It's, it's okay. It's okay. I hope it's not on the test either. So, um, yeah, Monday is a holiday, isn't it? So let's switch back over. Um, Midtown says, give me, give me, give me, boom! Yeah, pretty much. That's that's pretty much what the, uh, that essentially pulse, that neutron star, which is essentially a pulsar is doing. Pulsars are kind of neat because they, because it's rotating so quickly and it's, okay. So I don't remember why it does it, but because it does something, you can see it flash so many times. Like really quickly, like a um, beacon almost. Like a beacon. All right, I'm trying to find the dogs so I can we can get the dogs up and we can talk to them and throw cheers at them. Um. Anyways, so go ahead and ask questions. Please put a star in front of them so they stand out. I will do my best to find all the questions and to ask all the questions or answer all the questions. If I don't know the answer. Sometimes somebody in the community does, because y'all are awesome. And yeah. <laughs> Susie says, and had essentially warned everybody, it's a fun script today. Lots of techno babble. Um, oh, thanks for the follow. I don't know why sound's not working. And make it rain! All right. Um... Hanny's asked, when we see light from stuff so far away, are we seeing visible light or red, shif red shifted gamma rays? All right, so I'm a little rusty on my Doppler and I can't remember if it's red, if it's coming to us or moving away from us. But I don't know, it might not just be gamma rays and it might, it may or may not be visible light. I don't know what kind of light this telescope collects. Um, in particular, but it is shifted one way or another. I just literally don't remember enough astronomy to give you a for sure definite answer. As a reminder, I know enough astronomy to be dangerous. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> one girl with two beakers says about Puck, he's just excited. Ah. <sighs> Larry adds, "You, the U.S. quit nucle testing nuclear weapons because modeling nuclear explosion at the particle level is so good. For real. Um, flops. Time path adds flops, a factor for computer powers. Yes. Um, I don't remember in particular what flops stands for. Um, I have to sprinkle treats for Tinker separately because uh, it's been a minute. And, but yeah, that is definitely one way to measure everything. It's just easier sometimes for me to explain things in cycles and days and how things that are done. So, <sighs> Trucker Kev asks, can Twitch streamers overlay a V, a Victor uniform meter on the screen for audio output cues? I don't know what a, a Victor uniform meter is. Do, 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 do. And yes, refs, Matt, planetarium domes are amazing. I am definitely a planetarium nerd. Um, Hanny's asked, do stars ever change axis orientation like planets? I just wonder if there's a safe location near the system. Not a clue. Not a clue. Larry's like, what holiday? Um, hell holiday... On Monday is November 11th, so depending on where you are in the world, 
it has different names. In the U.S. it's called Veterans Day. I think elsewhere it's called Remembrance Day. Um, or Armistice Day. It also is Mercury Transit Day, as Larry says. Um, Planetary Pan says, Red is moving away, blue is coming towards us. Thank you for the reminder. I knew one of them is the other. Um, which telescope? Okay, so let me look back and see what telescope that was from. This was from the... It doesn't say. Oh no, this was from Hubble, so it had to be mostly, um... Hubble does mostly, uh... <laughs> The mail came. Uh, Hubble does mostly visual and um, it does some infrared, but it doesn't it doesn't capture gamma. So this is mostly within Hubble spectrum, which is mostly visual and a little bit beyond visual. Um, so that's from Hubble. Uh, Veronica Kier says a transit or asks the transit in Mercury is on my calendar for Monday. I'm West Coast and heard not visible. Any details to share? Oh my. Um, Hannies and Midtown add in with the fact that flops is floating point operations per second, which that is indeed a kind of big deal. And there's a article on space.com, Mercury, space.com with the Mercury transit uh, webcast to watch. Um, oh, volume meter is, that's what VU means. Okay. Um, gamma rays would be Blue shifted, so red shifting would take you into longer waves like infrared. Okay. Thank you, Planetary Fan, because I, I like it when someone... <laughs> I like it when someone in chat knows more about this stuff, so I can just be like, I don't know the answer, but this person does. That it actually helps me learn, too. Um, I get numbers backwards, and apparently things in chemistry... Sometimes I can get... Um, in chemistry, I struggled with the pH scale because I just flop things around in my brain. It's not that I just would get them backwards and it took so long. Frequencies versus wavelength. One is always backwards. Yes. Yes. Um, Larry adds that the mercury or the transit of mercury is best viewed at 50 diameter magnification. Good stuff. I don't know what I'll be doing on Monday, so... One girl, two beaker says, everyone struggles with the pH scale. Ha ha ha. Yeah, but like when you're getting stuff wrong on a test because of it, I always, it always made me feel really stupid. This is how a, uh, like I, I was really struggling in chemistry. So I know, I know more than the average person about chemistry, but I also know that I don't... I'm not a good person to come to for any of it. Oh my goodness. I... I yeah. Yeah. Also, don't try to double major in computer science and chemistry at the same time. It's just... It's just not good. It's just not good. It, it really isn't, especially when you're doing real well in the other and the other and uh, you when you're doing real well and you feel pretty confident in one and then you're just like flailing in the other. Uh, don't mix Jack Sex and Mr. Clean. Yes. Agree. Do not mix ammonia and bleach. Bad things happen. Ugh. 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 Miss Town says, now I have to deal with borking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Walker. 
Hanny says computer science and business could work. Hey, favorite human. I'm not even going to ask. I'm not even going to ask. Oh, he's playing with the dogs. Wait, do you think a double major in computer science and business would work? Oh my. If you want a god awful headache. He said something about an awful headache, so I'm going to take that as a no. No, no, you could do it. It'll definitely set you up for a lot of money. <laughs> Doable and worth the investment. Doable and worth the investment. Um, oh, and uh, about the Mercury Transit, Larry adds in. Freezer said you gotta have the dark filter in front of the objective. Yes, do not look at the sun directly. Chat says hi, heart. Chat says hi, darling. He, he's just gonna be off screen. Um, so, uh, that is literally all the news I have for, for you today. Um, it always feels weird when there's only three stories, but that's simply because sometimes rockets can be so much. Um, I hope I answered everybody's questions or chat answered everybody's questions. Uh, Dr. Pamela will be back on Monday or Tuesday. I'm not sure. Oh no. When is she traveling? Anyways, Dr. Pamela will be back from traveling eventually. <laughs> uh, so in the event that, you know, myself or Dr. Pamela can't host, we're, Susie's uh, all set up to host as she was yesterday. <laughs> um, so as a reminder, uh, we stream every, most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern. I actually, because Monday is technically a holiday, I don't know if we will be streaming. Um, I'm going to call it and say we're not streaming. I'm just going to call it and say we're not streaming on Monday. Um, Sunday is indeed photo day. I will still stream on Sunday. We will work on Eda Karina, EDA Karina. Um, Hanny says she must have a lot of frequent flyer miles. She has some pretty nice uh, status. She really does. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, do, 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 do. I'm trying to think. Uh, we archive pretty much everything on YouTube. Uh, you see the fundraiser bar at the bottom of your screen. Hi, Raj! You, you, you were a little late. You were a little late. Uh, we are, looks like, over 61% funded for our servers for next year. And it is only the 8th. Thank you to everybody who has already donated. You are amazing. Oh, and thank you for the bits, Trekrika! And make it rain! And yes, the uh, the bar for the face reveal of the favorite humans is still going, but because that's a silly goal, it's not always up. Um, that's just gonna go until it, it goes. When we get enough bits, the face reveal face reveal will happen. Um, he's doing weird things off off the camera. Anyway, uh, I think, I think that's, that's all. My brain is deciding to just be like, nope, nope. Uh, come on. There we go. Um, oh, Gem Doctor says the wine on the ISS thing, Annie, uh, French, the French Bordeaux is being cellared on the ISS for a year to test, but it smells like a publicity stunt to me. Uh, it, it can be both. It can be science and a publicity stunt. Uh, Japan put a rare coffee beans on a sounding rocket that went technically to space. And I'm sure those sold for a whole lot of money. Raj Luther says, what have I missed in today's live stream? The good thing is you can catch the video on demand or later the, um, the video will be up on YouTube. So, there were computers. I remember that. I'm sorry. I think my migraine is, the tail end of my migraine is coming back because that. 
Veronica Kier says, I hope a uh, face reveal happens in time for a wedding picture. If it doesn't, y'all are just going to get silly wedding pictures. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. I, I think I am still dealing with the tail end of the migraine because I can feel my brain just turning to mush. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap everything up. Um, y'all have been amazing as always. Oh, Larry has snuck some news in there. We will probably talk about that next week, uh, Larry. Um, Larry adds, the Senate is considering extending uh, ISS mission slash funding to 2030. We will talk about that, if I remember, on Wednesday, depending on how much rocket news we have. Uh, because, yes, that would be amazing. And I still need to figure out how many tables are in space. So this is your reminder that there are still four toilets in space. And uh, yeah, this has been a production of PSI. That's Planetary Science Institute uh, out of Tucson, Arizona, working collaboration with Youngstown State University here in Youngstown. It's sunny outside um, Ohio. And I think there was snow. I think I saw, saw snow. Today's script was written by Dr. Pamela Gay. We are produced by Susie Murph. I have been your host, Annie Wilson. And y'all are awesome. We are here literally because of you. So thank you for all of your donations, your bits, your subs, your pledges on Patreon, your merch purchases, your... I don't even remember what else we do. But literally, thank you. And if you can't afford to contribute monetarily, that is fine. It's okay. Another good thing you could do to help us is just share us with your friends or enemies. It's okay. Just inflict science on people. Um, also, follows are free. Subscribing to our YouTube is free. Our podcast is free. I think Susie is going to record today's podcast, so there will be no dog barking and <laughs> things of that nature. One girl says, uh, I share you with my enemies. Okay. Your enemies might not think you're their enemy, but that's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for being amazing. And if the skies allow, which they don't often in Youngstown, don't forget to go outside and look up. And wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful insert time of day here. And I will see you all on Sunday. Yeah, I'll see you all on Sunday uh, for Sunday Science. And that's all I have. So again, thank you. Bye.